All right, no problem. So, uh, guys, apparently they've made me the uh, MC of all this thing, and what that actually means is I'm going to uh, call out to the tricksters and um, tell them who's presenting next. So just to get started, uh, Andrew and Cody, you guys are the next two on, on deck. Be ready for all of that. Um, this is a session that has been at uh, MMS um, for many time, many years. It is well received. It's meant to, to show you uh, some quick tips that uh, a lot of your fellow uh, admins may not know. Uh, so with that, I'm going to find my mouse and share off my screen number three. And I'm going to start off with my tip of the day, just to give you guys an example of what it is. So here's CM Trace. Everybody loves CM Trace because it shows you all the log files and all the rest of that fun stuff. In here and as I scroll through you can see stuff there's yellow red and whatever but one of the tips in here is that you have this highlight option so you know mine is just to put uh, I want to search for the word warranty in my log file so I put it in here and it's highlighted so as I scroll through the list I'm gonna try to find it really quickly and it's really hard to see because nothing stands out there's too many yellow and existing red uh, items in so the tip is, is to go up to your files, go up to preferences, change your highlight color from the yellow to this hot pink. And then as I scroll through that same list, it steps up, it pops out instantly exactly what I want to look for in this log file. So these are the type of tips that we're looking for. Something really quick, simple, um, doesn't, doesn't have to be in depth, but something quick and simple like that. So that's my quick trip, tip, trick of the day. Wow, I swear I haven't started drinking for the day. So with that, I'm going to say that, uh, Andrew, you're next up. What's your tip of the day? I am here. My tip is uh, with PowerShell. Let me find my, let me share my PowerShell window here. There we go. All right, everyone see my terminal here. Hopefully it's nice and big. Test. Everyone can see it? Yeah. Cool. Um, First tip, use Windows Terminal. It's pretty cool. Um, you can theme it. Um, but the real tip is, um, Cody, the next presenter actually, showed me this. Um, PowerShell has something called um, variable squeezing. And what it is, is you can use, so say like, you use, usually you do like dollar variable equals, um, and you can use the command get child item, and that'll pop, pop that, uh, that the results of that command and that variable. But say you want to use that variable at the same time as um, you can use the variable at the same time as uh, assigning it. So I can do this. If I, I can do if, or I can do a um, for each. Wow, I can't spell uh, when I'm sharing things for each. And I can do for each dollar child in, and then, and then if, oh, you can actually wrap the variable in um, parentheses, get child item, and that will assign the variable at the same time. And then we'll just do right up, but. And doing that at the same time as, as running it, it's actually running the get child item, but it also, if I look at var, it actually has the, um, the assignment in there as well. So it kind of um, it outputs the it outputs the variable and assigns it at the same time. Um, so if you have something that's like super long and complicated in here for this variable, so you see, like you do can you can do like where um, name of like and so now I filtered it and I've also saved that filter when I used it and that's my trick. That's great. Um, so, Cody, start getting on deck there for us. Sure. And Benjamin, you're uh, coming up after that. All right, Cody, you ready? Yeah, I'm just starting to share. Is it uh, displaying? It is 
displaying. Awesome. So I did see right on the first slide, it did say like less than 500 lines of code. So this is only 440 lines. Um, but really, no. So it's a function that I already have on GitHub. What it boils down to is I've actually created a function that allows you to parse CM log files, uh, but it also allows you to do it very, very quickly. And as part of that, you can apply regex filters as well as some time filters and severity filters. So what I've done already, what I have prepared is uh, this machine has an application deployed as well as a software update group, and those are applicable. So here's an update 7-zip. Here's an application edge available. So I'm going to go ahead and just run install on these. Why not? And while that goes, I'll just go ahead and run this function. So the function itself is kind of lengthy because I'm trying to account for all of the log formats. But what's neat is I'm actually pulling in Look at all logs. They're pulling in every single log in my CM trace directory. There's 104 logs. I actually just parsed all 104 logs three times in the time that script took to run. Uh, I've evaluated every single line and ran regex checks against these filters. So you can see, and sometimes stream reader tosses in there. But uh, so now, if I actually go and look at some of these saved bits, it's like have log lines. We can actually go and watch with this app. We can see where I actually compiled policy, requested it, uh, did the assignment enabling. You can see the downloading. And I'm pulling these into PS custom objects. So you've got the component, the type, the thread, the timestamp. These are all objects that you can then go and filter. Uh, and you can kind of watch that for everything. So this is really nice if you're trying to go and validate uh, if something happened potentially, or if you want to go in and even say, like, that CCM log file, see Windows CCM logs, add dot log, and then I could even say like, show me all the errors and warnings, and I'm going to parse that and just immediately pull out all of the errors and warnings, so that you only can see those. Or if you care, you could even say, this is kind of like just doing a filter for a where filter for timestamps, but where get dash date, uh, let's say we'll just say add minutes, negative fifteen. There's all the log lines within the last 15 minutes, for example. So you can kind of get really creative and combine the various components of it uh, and really get some awesome data out of log files. That's my tip. So, uh, Cody, nice. can you tell me where we uh, can get this today? Yeah, absolutely. So it is going to be on my GitHub. So it'll be github.com forward slash Cody Mathis123 forward slash CM dash ramblings. Uh, and then in there you'll see get dash CM log file dot ps1. So what would it be? Uh, would it be blob master get dash. And Cody, you can send that to me later, right? And um, we'll um, absolutely we'll post that. Yep. Sure. So uh, Benjamin okay. is Next, uh, with Mike and uh, David after that, I want to remind everybody to, uh, particularly if you're not presenting, to uh, mute your, your mic. Uh, so uh, I'm so back. So. Benjamin, you're up, baby. All right. Um, th that was pretty cool. I got to just say, Cody, that was pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> so my tip is uh, uh, taking a divergent from the PowerShell stuff. Uh, and in SQL, in uh, SQL Server Management Studio. Um, so uh, let's see, the first thing, uh, there's a, um, there is a view named v do underscore group map, and group map has all of the information about your hardware inventory. And so what I've done is I have some hotkeys so that if I know I want to just look at something, I can uh, just quickly run that. <clears throat> so. And we'll get. Well, I'll I'll do a little bit with this. And so, what this really looks like is in your tools options. If you go down to keyboard, can you actually see that, or is it? I I tried to make yes, it bigger. Yes, but it but, is a little small. If you have yeah. zoom it. As yeah, a good this is. 
I have it on my presenter box, but not this box, I realized once we started. So um, uh, so uh, bear with me on this, but in here you have these shortcuts that you can assign. And when you first uh, when you first install it, the very first one, Alt F1, is automatically there, but none of these other ones are there. And what I've done is on uh, if I use Control plus the number three, it will select star uh, top 100 star from whatever I've got uh, highlighted. <clears throat> and so uh, what what it really does is whatever is here, whatever you have highlighted when you click on that, um, it will just insert that into the um, into the select top 100 star from, right? So that even means that you can do, uh, you know, aware in here. And I'm going to look for, um, we when we do um, custom inventory stuff, we append it with that HWINV underscore. <clears throat> so if I then highlight that and hit control plus three, it automatically just runs that SQL query for me. And, um, you know, and then I can have that in here. And let's say I take these and, and well, the reason why that's kind of help, helpful is if I'm like, oh, well, I want to know, I don't even know what I did with this. Um, so if I run that again without having to write the whole query out, it automatically grabs the first hundred of them and I can look at what that data looks like and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other, uh, things that you can do with it is, uh, you know, um, it, and where it really comes in handy is if you have like a, a long query, and I, um, um, I, I guess I can grab this. Um, it's, this is something I was working on the other day. Um, so if I, if I have this and I'm like, you know, I don't want to run the whole thing, I just want to look at that table, I can, you know, do that again, and I can just kind of see what's in there. Uh, that's where it kind of comes in handy, especially when you're looking at a bigger query with like SQL, uh, with a, uh, config manager data, you know, there's a lot of joins and stuff in there. You want to just look at that, look at it, right? Um, where that also comes in handy is if I, instead of looking at the, the top 100, if I wanted to uh, look at that definition, right? I'm like, well, what's in that view definition? If I, I have it set to control F1, and it will actually script out what the view definition is, right? So you can look and see where that data comes from. And again, that's up in your tools options, query shortcuts, and these are the ones that I have. Uh, SP help text is on, in there, SP who, because people use SP who a lot. Uh, SP lock, uh, select top 100 star from, and then space, and then let's select space, because sometimes if I've got a query and there's something like, you know, your get date, uh, if I were to run this, normally it's going to puke. And so instead, if I uh, just hit Control F5. It just runs it for me, and I actually have to switch it back. To that. <clears throat> then it runs it for you. So that's my quick tip: is to figure out what you use a lot, um, you know, uh, in in your queries or when you're just trying to figure out something in SQL, and add that into those query shortcuts so it goes a lot faster. That's Very a great nice. tip for those that spend a lot of time in uh, SQL and try to do reporting. So. Hey, Garth, right. can I can I uh, steal uh, just for thirty seconds to share the the lineup again? Sure. Okay. Cool. Thanks, uh, guys. I need to figure out how to make that flow better. But um, so just to show the lineup again real quick, I don't see Patrick A yet. So if you're out there, send me a message. We'll make sure we get you promoted. Um, so back to you, Garth. Okay, so uh, Mike is next up. Are you ready to go, Mike? Uh, yes, I'm ready. I'm sure okay. my screen. Yeah, watch your volume on your mic because you're a little quiet for me, at least. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you better. Okay. Did you share your screen there, Mike? I'm sharing. I'm sharing now. Let me know if you see it. There it comes. We got gotcha. you. Okay. So I wrote this script because a lot of companies I know went from Skype or Cisco Jabber for chat. Um, and it pretty much changes the default chat app uh, to Teams. So I'm going to show you right now what the current setting is. 
One second. So right here, if you see it, it's turned off, right? And here, the script checks the item providers in the registry and assess the item property default to Teams, which I'll show you here, which nothing currently exists. And then it checks your local lab data for the EXE. And what I'm, what I'm using to change the setting is the JSON file. So I'm going to run this. I have a timeout for a few seconds. And what that also does is it ends the process for teams and starts the process of teams after the setting has been changed. And within the registry, you know, that is now set to this default I am at teams. Yep. I'm going to also show you the before and after. So the before is the register as I am provider is a false. And then I'm setting that to true, as you can see here. Nice. I'm going to show you the setting in Teams now. Sorry for the lag. <laughs> And then it turns it on there. And now your Teams is uh, registered as your default chat app. Nice. Now, I have not shared this script because I've never shared a tip and trick at any of the MMS sessions yet. Um, but hopefully I can work with Greg and get this shared out somehow. Definitely. Yep. Send me an email and we'll, we'll either post it somewhere for you or if you give us I a have, link. I, I sent an email to you before the Great. Uh, session. Yep. Great. Thanks. Brian, uh, did, were there any questions about this uh, one in there? Yeah, I just had one quick one. Um, what, uh, what's the benefit of modifying the JSON config versus just, flipping the registry key um, you still have to restart so, the team's process in order for it to take effect so and i, I didn't notice that. any issues with it oh, okay sorry so i Good. tried that and it was inconsistent across multiple clients um so sometimes you would flick it and the setting in the json file would not change even though the registry setting has changed okay um, so i had to change the setting in the json file and then it stuck in once you change the setting in the JSON file, it plugs in the registry setting. But I'm doing all of oh. this to make sure that it's consistent. That's why. Across the okay. Board. Interesting. All right, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Mike, there. So we've got David, Jason, and uh, the quiet, shy Harjit coming up. Um, so, David, are you ready to give your yes, tip? Yes, sir. Yes, right. sir. Mine's, mine's much simpler. <laughs> it's, all tips are done. I feel, I, feel, I feel kind of dumb next to all these uh, smart guys, but um, mine is around autopilot, uh, Intune, and uh, being able to quickly test and uh, provision machines for testing and, and being able to recycle them. Uh, you know, kind of over and over. Just some of the things that that I've learned that may, maybe everybody else already knew, but um, it's uh, specifically some of it is uh, Hyper-V. So uh, one of the first things that I uh, tend to do in Hyper-V uh, is David, you're not uh, sure make sure. Screen. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't see it yet. No. Nope. Let me try. Let me try again. Let me try again. I hit the share button, but you know, Teams sometimes. Uh, you might want to. Might want to kill the video. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, you, oh, you've yeah. got a little uh, blocking that's going on too. So let me do that. Let me do that. 
try again. How about now? Yes, it looks like everything's coming through perfectly. Yep. All right. Be. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, so I, so, uh, so one of the things that I do, the first thing that I do is turn off uh, dynamic memory when you're testing, uh, when you're building VMs to test the autopilot process or the out of box experience process. Uh, and, and you know changes to the enrollment status page, things like that. Um, you just you know if you have dynamic memory enabled, you'll see a lot of lag in setup, and um, it, it just it just seems to take longer for it to catch up than when Windows is up and, and running and functional. So I typically take my VMs and I set them to like six gig or so of RAM, and then I turn off uh, dynamic memory if I'm going to be testing uh, specifically if I'm going to be testing the autopilot. Uh, process. The second thing that I uh, do is I, I always try to make sure that I have a TPM enabled uh, so that I can test BitLocker policies uh, and things like that with virtual TPM support now uh, in, in Hyper-V. It's really, really easy to just add a TPM uh, through this setting here uh, and, and have that, you know, turned on. So you can see those policies come down and see, you know, automatic enablement of BitLocker happen uh, on its own. The caveat to that is um, when you uh, do a checkpoint on your VM to, to, so you build a VM with a base OS, base Windows 10, 09, 2004, et cetera. And when it gets to this screen, you, you checkpoint that VM so that you can go back here to the out of box experience quickly and easily. Obviously in order to build it, to get it this far, you usually are attaching an ISO. Uh, and BitLocker automatic enablement does not like it when there's another drive on the machine, like a read-only drive with a disk in it. Uh, automatic enablement just doesn't work. So uh, typically what I do before I checkpoint that VM for testing is I remove that ISO because I've got it up to the out-of-box experience now and I don't need uh, that, that ISO anymore, right? So I can just remove the ISO, uh, add a T, uh, TPM if I don't have it, and then checkpoint that, um, that VM so that it's, you know, I have a checkpoint at the out of box experience. And then the last uh, piece to this is a uh, whole hearted steel. <laughs> Nikolaj Anderson uh, wrote uh, a nice little PowerShell um, uh, module script what went script, yeah, uh, that helps you import the device into autopilot directly from the command line. And so if you guys haven't seen this yet, this gives me the ability to have this out, you know, machine that's in the out of box experience, have hit shift F10 to open a command prompt. And then I can literally just open PowerShell from here, you know, so switch it over to a PowerShell uh, command prompt, set my execution policy, et cetera, uh, to whatever I need to do, right? And then install dash script, this allows me to pull it down directly through the interwebs. Um, yep. And uh, so, David, you're you're running a little long. Is there much left? Nope. This is it. All so right. uh, yeah. So you just uh, pull the machine autopilot. Sorry. <laughs> And then, you know, you run the rest of your command here. It'll go ahead and uh, download and import that script automatically into the uh, into the temp folder so that you can then um, uh, run that script and automatically import your device up into autopilot. Just super easy uh, way to get that machine ready to be able to test and build them over and over again. So thanks. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I if my math or looking at my chart is right jason's up and then the silent harjit is coming okay Jason. works better when i'm not muted <laughs> all right so uh my idea here was uh I, I have a big hairy powershell script that i basically use to teach myself powershell and i call it vest uh, it's the v &E support tool we had a problem where our help desk was just constantly escalating all kinds of stupid tickets to us that things like oh a reboot fixed it well why did you escalate it so um i put together this script um somebody had mentioned under 500 lines well it's like 580 or something but if you took out the comments and spacing it would be less but anyway um 
what VEST does is uh, go through and collect a whole bunch of information about the machine, look for pending reboots, make sure BitLocker is enabled, because we've had a few machines where TPM just disappears out of the BIOS. It's just not even there anymore. And so, of course, BitLocker stops working. Um, things like uh, fixed KMS activation, if it hadn't, hadn't, <clears throat> excuse me, hadn't talked to the KMS server for a while, uh, fix config manager remote control service, fix office file associations. We had issues with that where just associations disappear after a patch or something. And so um, what I did is um, uh, it checks these office associations in the uh, classes section of the registry. Uh, it checks the BIOS version based on their model. Um, I just have this information in here for my own, you know, sanity <laughs> to help keep them organized. Uh, it checks a whole bunch of uh, the most common apps that we have installed on everybody's machines to make sure they're up to date. Um, and of course, the OS itself to make sure that each version, uh, each build has the latest uh, communal update or UBR as it shows up in the registry. And if they're on an old one, then it will flag that and say, hey, you really need to upgrade really like ASAP. Uh, I have these in here, the, so the, the machines that we have running 1909 already, uh, we're, making, we're making sure they're still patched too. It's not going to flag them as out of date uh, as it would say a 1709 machine, unless they're not running the latest cumulative update. Um, but uh, what I, at the end of it, uh, it doesn't really show much while it's running. I've just got it de deployed available in Software Center. Um, if it doesn't find anything interesting, like a pending reboot or files out of date or BIOS or anything like that, it's just going to say, hey, you know, you should probably go look at the log anyway, because if you're calling the help desk, you must have an issue. So we'll go look at it in CM Trace. Um, you can just scroll through. I've got it uh, to where it, it's showing uh, all, the lit, all the applications. And then for services, you'll usually see some warnings where it's set to automatic, but it's not running. But most of these, as you can see, like Google Update or Maps or whatever, we don't care about those. So um, you can safely ignore that. But there may be other uh, issues that show up here that don't immediately get flagged. And so the help desk can take action on those things. Um, probably one of the biggest one would be uh, available disk space. It shows you know, where the, the user's disk space is used, at least in the most common areas. If they've got a bunch of stuff in the folder in the root of C, because for whatever reason, we're not allowed to prevent people from doing that. Um, you know, that's not going to show up here. But as you can see, we're checking the OS. And um, doing having this available uh, has really cut down on the number of help desk tickets that get escalated to my group. And so we can actually do work again. It's kind of nice. And um, when the help desk does ex escalate something that looks like it was probably pretty stupid to say, hey, did you run VEST? Well, no. Well, you should have. So go go run vest. We're not going to do anything until you run vest. So um, thankfully, we got some management buy-in on that to where we can kick stuff back to the help desk because they didn't even do any troubleshooting. It's like, come on, guys. <laughs> so um, anyhow, um, that's uh, vest, and I've got it available on my website, um, gibson99.com slash tools slash vest, or you can just go to the www.gibson99.com and get through it, get it there. So um, my blog is still kind of getting started. It's, I don't have much there, uh, at least nothing work related anyway, except for this. So, but um, as I said, it also writes a log, it also has a silent mode. Um, so it writes the log to C temp log and you can open it there in notepad or CM trace, whatever. But I've also got it set up to copy it up to a network share so that um, we can run it silently on a machine through a required deployment uh, in a collection. And that way, we can run it on somebody's machine without it bothering them, without needing to remote into their machine or anything, and have the log available in the network for us. So That looks, that looks cool. Thank you. So uh, with, with that, uh, I'll tell you to look at the chat because there seems to be a lot of people who like that. So uh, take a look at that. So Harjit is up. Uh, <clears throat> Motaz, I'm sure I didn't get that enunciation right. 
And Patrick A, are you out there? Did he come in line? <clears throat> yeah, he's in there. He's just got an extra yep. at for his name. Okay. So, uh, Harjit, you're next up. Okay. Are you guys seeing my screen at all? Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. How do we know if it's yours? Okay. <laughs> Connect. All right. Now you see something? All right. Anyways, uh, my tip is really, really simple. It's just basically some shortcuts and how to launch some stuff. Uh, some of you may, uh, may know about this already. So one of the common things we do as uh, Config Manager admins is uh, we tend to run the Config Manager applet. And, um, you know, the way we normally do that is we go to Control Panel and then, you know, uh, hold on. So Control Panel and then... We go to system and security, and then go down all the way down to config manager to get this applet. That's pretty tedious, especially when you're telling a user to do all these steps or something like that, and then we're trying to run these actions, right? So a simple way to do this is basically to use the control command, and you can do this in the run command, or you can do this in uh, command prompt or even PowerShell. So for example, if you did, um, the run command, I'll just do it in command prompt, for example, um, just so I have it nice and big here. So the command is called control smscfgrc, hit enter, and it brings you the output, and then you can do what you need to do. Um, and there are various other things that you can do with control. Obviously, control will open up your control panel, right? And then uh, you have control admin uh, tools that brings you to your admin tools folder if you have all your Active Directory uh, tools and stuff like that here. So there's a lot of stuff like that that you can do, which, which uh, makes it really easy. Uh, another thing I want to show you, so uh, in case you don't see the command, that's right here, SMS uh, CFGRC. The other thing I want to show you is uh, you can create shortcuts. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, there's another command called control slash name and then Microsoft Windows update. I hope this works. Oh, it does. It brings you directly to Windows update um, portal on Windows 10. All right, the other thing I want to show you is how to create shortcuts to get to Software Center. So easy as it is, you do a new uh, shortcut and you type in Software Center with a colon and do a next You can give it a name, for example, Software Center, finish, you get the shortcut, maybe right click on it, properties, change icon, it'll default to the software center icon, which is located in this location, or you can choose something else that you want. Now, when we double click this, it brings you to software center. Uh, finally, the last uh, thing, I won't do the demo because of time, is I'll show you the other commands that you can do. Uh, to create these uh, shortcuts. For example, if you just want to have a shortcut that launches, brings it directly to the uh, applications node, um, this is what you type in. Um, and, you know, and for software updates and um, imaging um, and so on and so forth. Those are my tips for today. Thank you, Virgin. So, Motaz, you're, I'm sorry about pronouncing your name wrong. If you can tell me how to say it again. <laughs> Hello, you hear me? Yes, I can. You said it as right as it could be, so good job on that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, tell me when you see it, please. Got it. Yep. Okay, so uh, the reason I'm using PowerPoint is because you have to read the naming convention. You have to look at it and know what I'm trying to do here. And I'll be presenting and showing how is it useful in Microsoft Intune console. 
So uh, we have done the migration to Microsoft Intune for our mobile devices, and we are in the process of doing that for uh, PCs as well. Uh, what we are realizing as we go with the migration is that uh, the policies names gets very complex and the list will get huge. No matter what you do to trying to simplify, you will always end up with a big list that gets very confusing on what's assigned to what and uh, how you manage the complexity here. So this is why we have uh, this naming convention for any configuration item that we define in Microsoft Intune. So uh, you can we can define things in Microsoft Intune, as you might already know, things like device configurations, which breaks down into all these kinds of configuration items. So we can define a device restriction, a device feature, Wi-Fi, email, VPN, SCAP, uh, PK PKCS certificates, trusted certificates, another custom XML profiles, certificate connectors, terms and conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a lot to uh, to manage here and list in the policies, and also it becomes uh, more complex with Intune managing all kinds of platforms. So you have Windows, iOS, Android, and then you realize that Android has multiple breakdown. You have Android admin mode, Android enterprise, Android work profile, etc. So the complexity is just uh, huge, and without a proper naming convention, mistake human error becomes inevitable. So this is what we came up with. We have every policy we define. Uh, or a configuration item, we start by the environment uh, type and then the config type, uh, which we uh, have coded each kind of configurations, and then the platform uh, that is targeting that, uh, for which this configuration is defined. And then we use uh, a project specifier that helps us define the meaning basically of that configuration, besides filtering and categorizing by environment, config type, platform, uh, or other parameters of the uh, policy, we go through the, uh, we use the project specifier to say something like it's applied for, uh, for we, we use a project specifier like the company name, then try getting uh, lower down in granularity, saying shared devices or saying employee owned devices or company owned devices, and then you can go further for a specific sub projects. And then you have the geoscope. So we are a multinational company. We have uh, sometimes different regulations or different configurations that needs to be applied based on geography. So maybe in uh, North America, you want to do something different from Australia. So that's where you designate that in the name. And then finally, uh, the Virgin, which is very important and keeping like a sequential increase. And then whenever you're testing something, uh, you uh, can distinguish what population is in which version of the policy that you are applying. So, um, so let me here just try to go to the, uh, uh, okay, so I think that was enough for the uh, explanation. Let me show you a real example of how this is useful. So these are the configurations we have, and uh, it's not only in configuration profiles, we have things defined in client applications. So uh, the filtering capabilities also in Microsoft Intune uh, they are not. Uh, they are not exactly what uh, what can help us filter or search for the policies the way we want. For example, we don't have anything that can sh search by the geography or by the profile type. So things get confusing. So if you used iOS, like sometimes you would mix up device features with device restrictions. You wouldn't know what you're looking for. So uh, this is where this becomes beautiful when you are searching. So let's say I would like to look for all device restrictions I have. So I would type dr. And then let's say I would like to look for device restrictions for iOS only, so I would say DRI. And then I would like to just look at exemptions for device restrictions that I have applied, so I would say EXMDRI. So I'm looking only at the device restrictions that are applied as exemptions to the public general policy, and that's applied to iOS. And that's similarly... Four minutes. All right, so that's pretty much it, really. I hope that I have conveyed the... Uh, the message, I, I use a similar concept with groups, but it helps us basically to make sure the policy we are applying goes to the right group, uh, to the right population, and it helps us manage the complexity uh, of our policies. Thanks. So if you can get Greg the PowerPoint, people can read up on it and sure. um, find out more about it uh, from there. So we have Patrick, Damien, Matt, and then Matthew uh, all on this coming up. Patrick, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am. And you should be seeing my uh, uh, PowerPoint really quickly here, right? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to do uh, less than four minutes, hopefully, since I'm about 10% of Cody's 440 lines. Um, I'm a public K-12. Some of the systems here are donated, and we kind of have a hodgepodge. So basically, I needed a way to know how many computers I don't know about. Um, so I made a little 40 line script. 
Um, it creates a model folder under device collections, it creates an unknown models, then it creates and queries the make and models of the things that are queryable in the most traditional uh, syntax that you're using. Um, obviously, it fails if the collection already exists, but then it also adds those to an exclusion rule on unknown models. So then it just kind of begins to whittle down um, some of the systems that are out there that I don't know about. When I started this, it was the Nook 6 i5s SYH that uh, they were notorious that I had to do a little hoops to get through there. I think Michael might have even wrote something up on that. So really what it does is it creates the models folder and then dumps all the systems in here. At the bottom on this screenshot, we get my unknown models. And right now I have 102 systems that don't reply to the normal uh, query rules. And the other thing I mentioned is it does automatically throw the device collections it creates into an exclude. Um, the script can be found there. And that's really about it. Where's my... Uh, no, apparently I closed out of PowerShell here to actually show you the script in person. That's okay. I'm sure everybody will be more than happy to look at the script and and get an understanding of it. All right. Thank you. That was under four minutes. <laughs> yeah. Brian's our timekeeper. I'm not. So uh, Damien, Matt, and Matthew. Damien, are you... Uh, there. Okay, yep, go on. Just had to come off mute. Oh, right in the nick of time. Yeah, the button, it had to tell me it was, yeah. So, short version. Uh, all right, I think I hit the screen share. Is that showing? Yep. Cool. All right, so this was something that I slapped together and used a lot because I kept running into this problem. Uh, where you have updates that you need to decline that are not visible in the WSUS console. Uh, Exampling things coming from certain third-party catalogs. Dell. Yeah. Um, or if you have a specific update where it's like, I want to get rid of this specific one, and I don't feel like digging through the 75 update for Office 2016 to find that specific one. Um, the default view uh, for software updates shows you article ID and get CM software update loves article ID. And so you can grab that uh, article ID and then the property you want on that is the CI unique ID, which you can then feed to the WSUS, get WSUS update. Um, so I, Put the actual code for this up in a gist or uh, you know, your site code, your provider name, your WSS name, um, and then some information on that um, to make use of for it. Um, one of the other things you can use this for is basically anytime you can do a you know, get CM software update something, for example, since a certain vendor is bad about the way they do their catalogs, uh, it is sometimes a get CM software update where vendor equals blah and greater than or um, group by article ID where count greater than one. And you can iterate through those and uh, clear those out, uh, ideally before you download their content and blow up your um, your database. So that's, uh, I pasted the link there to the uh, post in the chat, and the gist is embedded in there for people to uh, grab and use. Okay. And Was that, I'm not trying to cut you off. I'm just looking at the time and noticing that we've got 13 minutes left, and there's a long list, and I'm uh, thinking that. Uh, it looks like I'm going to say the last four on the list are all going to get cut. Greg? Yep, that was that was all I had. I wanted to just kind of knock that out nice and quick for you guys. Okay. So, uh, hey, the reason why I'm cutting the last four is all uh, almost all of you guys are MMS presenters and have presented at other events. And I want to see uh, Matt, Matthew, and uh, Nathan. 
Um, so, Matt, are you ready? I think so. Let me go ahead and just smash the share button here real quick. I'm coming with a really short, and probably somebody else may already know about this, but I'm going to go ahead and present it anyway. Let me go ahead. I'm going to put a URL into the chat for everybody. And where I found this is actually, or how I discovered this was, uh, I was watching an episode of the Intune training series from Adam and Steve. Uh, and there was an offhand, they were doing an interview with Michael Niehaus, and he made an offhand, like, real quick reference to, hey, we have uh, autopilot deployment monitoring. And I said, wait, what? There's a what now? Uh, so that's the URL that I just put in the chat. You guys can click that. And this is not super obvious, or it wasn't super obvious to me. Um, but there, if you come through devices in the admin portal, um, and go to uh, monitor underneath the devices node, there's this little doohickey down here that says autopilot deployments preview. And so what this gives you, uh, and I thought this was brilliant when I you know, finally figured out where this was, um, is it tells you exactly all of your autopilot enrollments in near real time. So you can see where you are. Hey, there's Mike Niehaus right there in the chat. Uh, so it basically near real time gives you your uh, data and info about who's going through autopilot and how long it's taking them and whether or not they're succeeding or failing or, you know, kind of what's happening. Um, so just a real quick trip, uh, quick tip. And this uh, was, was really helpful for me. And I, like I said, I didn't know it existed and I don't think it's well publicized enough. So there you go. That's what I have for you. Thanks. I love how some of your deployments took one second to, 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 to complete. I mean, that is fantastic. Yes. We're, we're working at warp speed here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm just going to, to, to make the comment about the last four. The, the, the one thing that we were planning to do is uh, have this event again. Uh, so anybody who did get missed would be brought over to the next one. Um, so with that, anyways, let's go on to. Were you going to say something? We're going to run till five after, so we got we got 15 more minutes. So we'll fill that with everybody, and then we'll take the last few minutes after that to do the drawing. All right, so uh, Matthew, you're up. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so this will be super quick. Um, I've um, joined or chatted with the Witted Men's Slack and Discord group. Uh, it may have helped me with numerous things over the years that I've been doing uh, Config Manager Men, and uh, I would urge everybody to join and get involved. A good number of the presenters here are already in the group, um, whether they're um, super active or not. But uh, you can see here, you go to winadmins.chat, click on the Come Chat button, and it will give you either a link for Discord or to Slack if you can't install Discord for some reason. Easiest way to get in is this link here, aka.ms slash winadmins. And as soon as you hit that, you get a Discord invite. And that's my tip. Join the community. Garth, you're on mute. Which is preferable sometimes. Oh, a tag again. So I, I must have double tapped it because uh, that. But anyways, the point being is that there's a lot of communities out there. I encourage you to, to look at them, whether it's the user groups, whether it is uh, working in the uh, forums or uh, uh, Reddit or whatever. There's lots of communities out there. So, so uh, after Matthew, it was Nathan. Nathan, you ready to go? Yes, I am. We see a screen. Can you see a screen? You can. All right. Cool. So today's tip, if you hate writing XML, but sorry, what? All right. If you hate writing XML, or if you're tired of commenting items out in your UI at plus plus XML for testing or running through test cases, I built a tool called GUI plus plus, which is a WYSIWYG editor for Jason Sandy's UI plus plus. Uh. 
Nathan went on mute. You there? Nathan? Who muted me? I don't know. (laughs) Oh, you punks. All right, so sorry. Start over with the remaining three minutes. GUI++, if you're using UI++ right now and you hate writing XML, or you're tired of commenting out steps in your UI++ XML to run through test cases, I built a WYSIWYG editor so you can see what you're going to get with your XML in UI++. Guarantee you there are bugs. It's alpha. It does rely on UI++ 3.0 because there are some attribute changes uh, that Jason made. I'm tracking issues in GitHub, so if you've got features, uh, feature requests or bugs, please uh, submit an issue. And uh, you likely won't have the exact same file coming out if you just import and export. And I've got more info on that in the repo. So without further ado, we'll do a little bit of a demo here. The application launches to load save. We can load in an XML file for UI++. And we've got a few configurable items here. This is the base UI++, like your title, uh, your icon file, the, con- the font color, and or the sidebar color, and then whether or not to show. And then in your Actions tab, it will actually show you a preview of what your actions will look like in UI++ when you run it. And all of this is dynamic, so we can change the color here. We can change the title, say maybe you run a comic shop. And we can even change the icon here. So we'll say comic.isoops, comic.ico. There we go. And it's going to actually update everything for you dynamically. We can add steps, remove steps, move steps in here. So if we wanted to do, uh, say, like pre-flight checks, we can add a pre-flight group here. And then we can add individual pre-flight checks to the list, modify them, let's say test check, add a description, warn condition, warn description. And then we can also preview for at least the pre-flight checks as a warn or a fail so that we can see, again, what it would look like in UI++ when this is run. Uh, Additionally, uh, the software tab (coughs) uh, implements all of the UI or the XML necessary to do your software or app tree, right? Uh, So you can add manual applications here that can later be referenced in your app tree, right? So we've got software groups and software refs here. We can change this to existing packages that are in here. Uh, And then you can also import Uh, from your config manager environment, all of your applications and packages uh, to make this much easier. So we could add from a scanned environment. I haven't scanned mine, so it's not going to work in this environment. And that is basically it. Uh, The tool is available on GitHub. If you trust me, there's the short link. Uh, If you don't trust me, you can go straight to my repo, uh, the zenerd forward slash GUI PP and then forward slash releases to get direct to releases. So, so I have to say a lot of people are uh, quite happy about that. Uh, although one person says that there's a problem with your uh, URL. Oh. Um, well, Kent, uh, apparently, according to my clock, oh, we got four minutes. So we can either do Kent or uh, does Kent want to follow up on su- such a fantastic presentation? We don't get nine have... minutes, Garth. Go ahead, Kent. Yeah. Oh. Let me try that. So I don't have... <laughs> Let me know when you see my screen here. I actually, I actually wrote a deck here. Do you see the deck? I see. The game of SKU. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> nice. So I, um, I've been missing MMS. Uh, been missing all of you guys here. So, so I have. A little thing here called the game of SKU. Uh, it's just something I've been working on um, the last couple of weeks. So just to give you, um, you know, what what it is. So right now, I have a, a bunch of enterprise IoT devices. The goal here is to manage them all with uh, with Intune and and later on also co-management. Um, and the issue is that, well the settings are not really applicable. So as you uh, can probably see 
over here, you know, when I'm setting up, you know, update setting and so on and so forth, the majority of these here are not applicable. Um, that's not only a challenge, but that also makes my boss a bit grumpy. Uh, so I, I have this old picture here of Mason, um, so I thought I would just pull it in here. Uh, <laughs> so so what is, what is the, the tip here? Um, for those of you who are starting uh, with, uh, with working with, with Intune, um, sometimes when you're creating a policy, um, that policy will only apply to certain SKUs. Uh, and you know, if you're working with with a pro or an enterprise, you really need to know what what it is that you're working on. In my in my environment, I was working on a SKU that wasn't even on the list of uh, of SKUs. So um, running this command here just gave me uh, the. Well, I can show you. Uh, see where I have you. I think it's right here. So if I just run. This command here, I'll get SKU 188. Uh, if I start, you know, looking for that, it's it's not even on the list of of, of SKUs. You know, maybe it doesn't have to be. I, I don't know, but it, it's not on the list. So um, instead of instead of creating everything in in, in the UI, uh, you know, the fix is really to convert your policies into OMA uh, uh, DM rules because they don't. They don't follow the same, apparently the same applicable rules. So, uh, so custom settings are not impacted by them. And you know, boom, uh, ten minutes later, I already had like 43, 44 compliant devices in here. Um, and that's really the trick. And 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 I was also looking at, um, I was also looking at this. I think I still have couple of more minutes now so but I'll, I'll give you the other link I was looking at because there was also a link that showed you know what are the uh, applicable policies for an uh, IOT enterprise but it turns out that 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 list there um, I mean there are so many other things that you can throw in there so just convert whatever you have into OMA DM and then start testing it out uh, and you'll be surprised and your manager you know will look like that so that was my tip in less than four minutes well, thanks. That's a great picture, Brian, you have there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it actually took a while to find a picture where he smiled. <laughs> That's I, uh, true. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Greg, um, you're going to – how are we going to do the – sorry, Adam, you're going to – we're going to have to – got time for one more. Garth, I think we can do one more. I bet you got five minutes to do that. Until five the, minutes after, yeah. yeah. Got time for another. Oh, so we're going to slip in Adam? Do we, we're going to slip in Adam? Yeah. All right. Adam, yeah, let him do it. Go. All right. All right. Well, let's see how gross you can be. Here we go. Well, I just posted all the answers in the, uh, in the chat now, so um, you guys can read ahead. Okay, so <clears throat> um, there's an issue with uh, – so you, basically – I was running into an issue where I couldn't get my boss's device uh, to get the latest feature update for 2004, and uh, he was on a Surface Pro 7 and um, couldn't sort it out and started digging and discovered that he was being blocked. And um, so we'd manually run the feature update and we'd get an error code that was very generic. And um, anyway, the more I dug around it, the deeper I got into the intricacies of how the compatibility appraiser database works and how that plays into your compatibility. And uh, so anyway, I wrote a PowerShell module uh, and, and a very lengthy, probably 2,500 word essay on future update blocks. So go check that out if you want. Um, anyway, I've got a module published to the PowerShell gallery called fu.ymiblocked. FU stands for <clears throat> feature updates. Um, so just in case you're wondering. So uh, anyway, you do import module, and that will install it from the gallery. And, uh, or sorry, install module, um, and then you import it. And then from there, you can um, get command dash uh, module. I don't know how to do this. The, um, it is, I do have docs uh, for it on the GitHub repo. Um, which you can get to from the blog there. And um, anyway, these are the commands you can run. So the basic one is, that you can run is just get you uh, get fu blocks. 
How's that working? Well, oh, I didn't spell that right. You can't spell F. There we go. I, I tabbed it and it didn't work right. Um, so what will happen is, so this is running against this local device and it'll make a new um, folder. Um, and inside here, it's gathering a bunch of data. If I had run a feature update and had a feature update, uh, like a Windows BT folder, it would capture that data and be able to process it as well. So it's just running through um, all the files that it's finding on the machine from where the appraiser has run and looking at the various appraiser databases that are on the machine. And um, then it goes through and ex uh, extracts the appraiser database and compares any blocks that you've got against the database to um, output results. So I've got one that I put in the oven before. And uh, so on this particular machine, the um, you if you were to run the feature update manually, you would have um, potentially gotten an error message um, in a human readable file sitting in your um, like the, the Panther folder. So you'd get a, a file similar to this. And I'm going to open this with Notepad. And it would look like this and just kind of be very generic and like, oh, what what is this? And so in here, I can see that there are some these um, app GUIDs. And if I go look these up um, manually, they don't really tell you much. But once you run them through the appraiser database and everything, you output a um, nicely formatted file that shows you the entry from the appraiser database that is triggering the block. And so what this tells me is that the block is on syskey.exe utility. And it's because I've got a reg key in this location for secure boot that is set with a value of one. And that's causing a, a three upgrade type block of three, which is a hard block. And then these would actually translate to um, uh, to a message. Or like if you go go to the AKA MS uh, redirect URL, that short short URL that they, they these would take you there. So anyway, um, but I also discovered in the database those it lists a way to bypass it. So I can, um, the script actually, or the module will, will output a reg file or, or both, a reg and a PowerShell file, depending on how you want to implement it. If you wanted to um, bypass the block, mm -hmm. you could just create a registry entry for this and bypass um, the block. All right, I'm done. Read the blog. Thanks. Hey, hey I made Merlin. it. Thanks, guys. Merlin, can you squeeze in three minutes? We'll, we'll 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 add you now if you can do it. Uh, yeah, sure. All I'm right. Good to go. Present. You're ready. Uh, sure. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, make it a short one. It's really simple. Um, that's a pun intended. And you'll see why. There's a lot of PowerShell scripting going on. Loving it. Um, if you want to improve your scripts, uh, your automations, both server side and client side, I found this really go really good uh, PowerShell module. Not bait not made by myself full credit goes to this guy or girl salad problem so i don't know um, what name he or she goes by but um the work uh, he or she has done is awesome and it allows you to replace all of your code um that you would otherwise use the powershell commandlets for to connect to the sms provider the sort of powershell configuration manager module or if you uh, like to use the wmi commandlets which are deprecated they don't work in PowerShell 7 uh, then go to this um, github repo and read all about it if you're not using it at least go through the scripts and learn about how you can uh, go about with all the sim commandlets because there's a few gotchas especially with the um, with how you invoke methods and I've learned a lot from this guy I've, I've actually contributed to this repo as well so um, there's there's one it's called CCM core which is for all the stuff that you would target uh, at the um, site server he's got another repo there for CCM client stuff so every time you think like oh, I've done this before how did I do it I've got to go through WMI Explorer and find that method again just use this module it is freaking awesome you build a connection to the provider uh, through sim you use the commandlets and you're good the plus side, the biggest plus side is the footprint is really low uh, as opposed to WMI and especially the PowerShell um, module. It leaves um, the session open. It actually um, opens up a user session. This one does not. Try it out. See if you can replace your existing 
uh, code with this one. There's not much to show here. There's no demo. There's just a URL. I'll put it up in the in the um, in the chat. And uh, I hope you have a lot of PowerShell fun with that. That was it. All right. Thanks, Merlin. You're welcome. So Garth, I'm going to share my screen, and I oh, think yeah. we can wrap this up. All right. Cool. All right, guys. This is great. Um, if if you learned something new today, throw it, throw something in the chat. Throw a little thumbs up or a little little hand clap or something.